upside down there. And so I saw something that said on. I thought it said no. <laughs> so I just left it. I'm going to turn my mic on. It said no. What do you do that? Okay, now we're on. So I'll say good evening again. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight in Chattanooga, and thank you for joining us from wherever you're joining us from, uh, potentially all around the world. My name is John Bradshaw. I'm from It Is Written, and it's my good fortune to share with you tonight our second presentation in Revelation Today, The Mysteries Revealed, where in this series of presentations, we dig deep into the Bible and unearth with the help of God's Holy Spirit the things that really matter to us today, answering life's biggest questions, guiding us to an understanding of the deep truths of the Bible. Now, before we go much further, I want to let you know that tonight we have a poll question that I would love for you to participate in answering, a poll question. There are several ways you can answer this question. You can answer it at Facebook, following our Facebook feed, or Twitter, following our Twitter feed, or at revelationtoday.com, or with the Revelation Today app. So I'm going to open the Revelation Today app, and it will say this. It will show you our poll question when you go to the Revelation Today app. And the poll question tonight is one I'd love to hear from you on. Here's the question. When do you believe Jesus will return to the earth? Within one year, that's A, B, five years, C, ten years, D, a long time from now. That's way beyond ten years. So what do you think? When do you think Jesus will return? I would love for you to give us some feedback. Easy way, use the app, the Revelation Today app. The quiz question will be there, and you can answer it for us or wherever you are, Twitter, Facebook, or the revelationtoday.com website. Then in a few minutes, we'll come back and get an answer. Uh, we'll aggregate the responses, and we'll see what you're thinking. Will Jesus come back within one year, within five years, within ten years, or he won't come back for a long time? Just will be interesting to take the pulse of our, our, our viewers for our second night of Revelation today. And I'd love for you to participate. I'd find that very, very helpful. Well, each night, we're going to do our very best to answer some Bible questions related to the uh, subject, or it could be general Bible questions, hopefully related to the subject that we're covering. Uh, if you'd like to get questions in and you're here, write them out and put them in our question box. You can even submit video questions. And at the Revelation Today app, you'll find out how to do that, and at revelationtoday.com. So, I believe we have some video questions tonight. Let's take our first video question and see what that is. I have a question. I'd like to know uh, what the red bloody moon represents in the Bible. It happened a couple of days ago, and people said it was some sign of apocalypse, and I just want to know what it means. Okay. The red moons, the blood moons the other night. I got a good view of the blood moon. I was at Mount St. Helens in California. We'd just been out to Mount St. Helens to the beautiful visitor center. If you've ever been there, you'll be impressed by it. And we heard the presentation and we looked around and we were, we were leaving as a matter of fact. And the young man in the National Park uniform told us, go back down the mountain a little way and there's a rest stop and go there. We wondered if we'd find the right one. I mean, we could get the wrong place. He said, you'll have a great view. We, we knew it was the right one. There were so many people there. And it was like, it was like Woodstock. There were even combi vans, VW vans. With, I was expecting barbecues and everything. It was like a, a party time. But there was a lot of people waiting to see the, the blood moon. And so we waited. And I, I thought several things. One, I thought, boy, it's cold here. And another thing I thought was, Oh, is it ever going to happen? And then the other thing I thought was, is that the blood moon? And it evidently was. Now, on a regular clear night, a regular night, you'd see this round white ball climbing up into the sky. But we just saw this dark thing. Really, it was kind of red. And there it was. We witnessed it with our own eyes. Now, some people had seized on this rare event and set forth the idea that this was somehow tied to the end of the world. Now, you know, I'm glad 
that you don't have to believe those things when they go around. There's no one making you believe that. In answer to your question, what did the blood moons have to do with the end of the world? The answer is, I'm sorry, it's not a very exciting answer, but the answer is nothing, nothing at all. Just about as much as Halley's Comet or, or, or a, a rain cloud. Nothing to do with the end of the world. Now, I know that in the book of Matthew, it does talk about the moon turning to blood. But if you look at that and the stars in the sky being shaken, that sign's been fulfilled. It was fulfilled 100, 200 years ago. So really, that's old news, the moon turning to blood. We've been there and we've done that. The blood moon's in the sky. You know what you, what you know and learn is that there's always someone willing to... Uh, there's always somebody willing to say that some sign or, or, or some event is a portend or is an omen of, this, of the end of the world. Sometimes it's just not. And by the way, I don't know if you caught me or not, but it has just come to my mind that Mount St. Helens has not been moved to California. <laughs> it's still in Washington. <laughs> just in case you're wondering. There's not two Mount St. Helens, there's only one, and it's the one in Washington that we were at, and I never ever did visit Mount St. Helens in California. I just have to be <laughs> very honest with you about that. Okay, <laughs> we have another question, another video question. Let's take a look at this one. Hi, I'm Miguel from Chattanooga, and John, I have a question. Was there ever a time you didn't believe in God, and if so, what made you believe in God more? Well, thanks, Miguel. Good question. Uh, was there a time I didn't believe in God? No, honestly, there wasn't. I was raised in a church-going family, so I always believed that there was a God, and I pretty well always went to church. But you know something? Irrespective of how you're raised, every individual has to come to the place where he or she accepts God for himself or herself. And that is, accepts Jesus as his or her personal savior. And I had to come to that place. What was very interesting for me is that I uh, had to unlearn a lot of what I'd been taught. I came to the place where I realized that while there was a God and I believed in God, I needed to be certain I believed in the God of the Bible. I was very wrong about a lot of stuff. And so I had to come to the Bible and... Uh, swallow my pride and manifest a little bit of humility and recognize that my opinion was not really what mattered, but what the Bible said. Uh, I, I, I privileged, I think, I think privileged to be raised to know God. What I say I think is that some people are raised, perhaps they're raised in a, a Christian environment, but, but maybe they're taught some things that aren't true and it colors their whole understanding of God and affects their entire Christian experience sometimes in ways that aren't good. So we want to come to the Bible and irrespective of our history, have open minds, open hearts, and pray that God's Holy Spirit would do what Jesus said he would do and guide us into all truth. All right, we have another video question. Let's take this video question now. Bradshaw, my question is, has the deadly wound in Revelation healed? And if so, when? Oh, good question. You read about that deadly wound in Revelation chapter 13. It talks about the beast that comes up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. It then says in Revelation 13 and verse 2 that the devil gave this thing his power and his seat and great authority. And then verse 3 says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. So is the wound healed? Well, you know, last night I said that I'd answer questions several ways. And one of the ways that I would answer questions would be to say, I'm going to leave that till a later night. That's one of the ways I could answer questions. So in answer to your question, uh, let me say, I'm going to leave that till a later night. For the simple fact that we're going to take an entire evening and talk about this subject. So it's a very good question. Uh, this beast in Revelation 13, whatever it, he, she, they is, whatever it is, it influences the whole world in a very powerful way. 
Uh, so we'll find out about it. We'll find out about the deadly wound and the healing of the deadly wound. I hope you'll hang in there with me. I have a couple of written questions here. One from Ethan or Ethan. If archaeology is opening Bible prophecies, and I'm sure he means opening our understanding of prophecy, why hasn't the Ark of the Covenant been found? It's a good question. And I'll tell you why. Looking for anything in archaeology is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Except the haystack is huge. You know, just Israel itself, while not as big as the United States, is big. It's bigger than your backyard. If you lost something in your backyard, that would be a challenge sometimes to find. I was in Jerusalem and I was just astonished to learn that the Jerusalem of Jesus' day is actually 30 feet below ground level in Jerusalem today. So there's 10 meters of detritus or 10 meters of city and foundations and ruins and previous cities between where Jesus walked and where we walk. So if Jesus was there 30 feet down and the Ark of the Covenant existed then, or even you might even say go back from Jesus' day, uh, it could be anywhere. You may even know which part of the city to look in, but it could be 30 feet down. Nobody knows exactly where in Jerusalem or if in Jerusalem the Ark of the Covenant was taken. So the reason it hasn't been found is the same reason as many other things have not been found. It's not fault on the part of the archaeologists. It's not fault on the part of God. It's not any negative reflection on the Bible or on the veracity of the Bible. The fact is some of these things were hidden away and just haven't been found. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found only by a stroke of providence. If you weren't going to use the word providence, you'd have to use the word luck. A Bedouin boy threw a stone into a cave, and he heard clank. He was just curious enough to go into the cave, and the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and they'd been there hundreds and hundreds of years. And that wasn't even a very obscured place, just a cave that not everybody went into. So it's quite easy to understand why certain things of archaeological importance haven't been found. There's a lot of places they could have been put and a lot of ruins between even where the archaeologist walks today and where societies existed in the past. Good question and I hope that shines some understanding onto the question. Antonio asks, were there more powers than those in Daniel? Okay, time for review. Let's see how you do. In the book of Daniel, chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has a dream. Cannot remember the dream, so Daniel the prophet explains the dream to him. King, he said, you dreamed of a great big image. The image had a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs made out of iron, and the feet were made out of Very good. That's good. The head of gold represented the kingdom of the silver represented the kingdom of Medo-Persia. Then the midsection of brass, that represented Greece. The legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay represented the divided Rome. Well, that was good. Eight out of eight. I didn't stump you once. Rome, no, no. Babylon ruled from 605 BC to, ha <laughs> gotcha. All right. 605 to 539 and so on. But that, that you did good. Very good. So now, those are the four major world ruling powers spoken of in the book of Daniel. Were there other world ruling powers? Sure, there were other empires. Um, you could even talk about the Mongolian Empire if you like. And others as well. Significant world ruling powers. I would imagine that if... Many hundreds of years from now, somebody were to look back on our day, they'd put the United States in that picture and saying that was a sick, it was really now the last superpower on the planet today. But God didn't bring into prophetic view every nation that ever was or every world ruling kingdom that there might be for a simple reason. In the Bible and in Bible prophecy, God brings into view those nations, kingdoms, places that directly impact his relationship with his covenant people. 
So in the beginning, we're introduced to a geographical location called the Garden of Eden because Adam and Eve were there. Not long after that, Ur of the Chaldees, Abraham, the father of the faithful, came from there. Then Babylon, where God's people were taken. Then Medo-Persia, who ruled when uh, Jewish society was reestablished. Then Greece, then Rome. Jesus was crucified on a, there was a Roman instrument of torture, that cross. And then the divided Rome, the gospel even spread out to uh, the then known world. It spread to the world. And so the Bible doesn't mention every place, every geographical location. You won't read about Australia in the Bible, Guatemala, Canada, they're, not, they're Fiji, not mentioned. Now, you do read about New Zealand in the Bible, where I'm from. Have you ever, have, you're not New Zealand. You don't remember that? <clears throat> Let me read this to you. You never read this. All right, I've got I to gotta find the right, the right place here. Let me see. Mm, what did he do? Okay, I want, I want to find the very passage here. You know, early in the book of Genesis, oh, I have a hard time finding it now for some strange reason. But did you ever read God created Adam and Eve and he put them in the Garden of Eden? That's, that was New Zealand. Did you not? <laughs> the Garden of Eden. You're not buying that, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, I don't say I didn't try. I hope you won't mind me just having a little fun there. Just making the point that not every place on earth is mentioned in the Bible, only those places that have a direct bearing on God's relationship with his covenant people. Now, in a couple of moments, not yet, not yet, thanks for your questions. By the way, please do submit your questions in our question box out front or online via the app or use the hashtag revelation today on facebook twitter and instagram and the questions will come and i'll do my best to give a bible answer for your bible questions we'll go to the poll result in a moment not yet i just want to remind you about tonight's poll when do you think jesus will return you can answer the poll easily on the revelation today app or at revelationtoday.com or at our twitter feed it's there on the it is uh, the revelation today twitter feed and uh, Facebook as well. So check those places. We'll get to that in a second. Now, uh, we took the camera out into the street and we wanted to ask people what they thought about the end of the world and where they believed the world was headed. Real people, real interview question asked, and we aggregated a few responses here. And here's what people told us about how they saw the end of the world. Take a look at this. I'm thinking a lot of fires, a lot of riots, um, a lot of cracks in the ground. I don't know, broken buildings, stuff like that. That's what comes to mind, like an apocalyptic kind of feel. I don't want to see the world in the negative pictures of like just being bum bumped and all that. I believe that the world should be and peacefully in lovely. Slavery, um, slavery is going to come back. Pollution, we're all going to die of suffering. It will end sad. If you look now, if you, if you look the, the world now, we can see that the world is not. Uh, uh, many things going around the world that is not good, no? I don't think it'll happen. Be honest about it. Oh, well, it'll keep on going, and uh, um, and I think uh, it depends on what human beings do with the world. Um, you know, as far as the uh, as far as the uh, uh, the ecology is concerned, and all that kind of thing. Oh, I don't. No, <laughs> no, I can't. It's not something that I want to give any thought to, actually. So. I, yeah, I hadn't thought about it, I guess. All right. Well, we asked a number of people what they thought about the end of the world. One man was speechless. <laughs> and we got a variety of answers. 
Tonight our presentation is Seeing the Signs. That's our subject tonight, Seeing the Signs. We want to take a look into the Bible and find out how the Bible addresses this subject of the end of the world. And I have a feeling that by the time we're done tonight, it won't be hopeless, but hopeful. It will be positive and looking forward with confidence. We always begin with prayer. Ah, before we pray, I said the poll, didn't I? So let's take a look. I wonder if we have the, the, the results of the poll. We asked when you thought Jesus would return. And uh, within one year, 5% said within one year. Within five years, 55% of people said five years. 27% said 10 years. And 12% of people said a long time from now. 60, 87, 99%. So evidently 1% of people just checked out. Or I suppose there were point so-and-so, point something. So it seems that the bulk of people who responded believe that Jesus is going to return within five years. Second was within 10 years. Well, it's interesting to find out how you view that, how people checking in with us at Revelation today see that question. Thank you for participating. I appreciate that very, very much. <clears throat> well, let's pray as we do each night and expect that God would bless us with his presence. Please, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to gather around the Bible. We thank you for your word and for your Holy Spirit who would come and help us understand your word. Tonight, we look at things that are relevant, relevant to where we are now, relevant to our own personal experience. Bless us and lead us, we ask you. Let your will be done. Thank you that we can rely now on you who can be relied upon. Guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. World War II began September 1, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. Ten days later, Canada joined World War II. But it wasn't for another two years until the United States joined into World War II, and we know now how that happened. It was December 7, 1941. Let me tell you what happened on that day. There were two men, two military men, two privates, who were manning a mobile radar unit at the island of Oahu. As they looked on the radar screen, they saw an omen of something that would turn out to be absolutely disastrous. Ultimately, what they saw turned into 2,400 American service personnel being killed, 3,350 American planes being destroyed, or badly damaged, and 18 ships lost. More than 1,100 died when the USS Arizona was sunk. And if you've been to that memorial, as I have a couple of times, and you've taken that little boat trip out to the Arizona, you've seen the, the little globs of oil still floating to the surface. And they tell you on that tour that oil is coming up from the USS Arizona still all these years later. A colossal tragedy. Two men were at a mobile radar unit on the island of Oahu. Their experience tells us that what took place later on did not really have to be. That is to say, it all could have been different. One of them saw on the radar screen what he thought was a squadron of Japanese planes heading towards Oahu. So the two men contacted their superiors at Fort Shafter, and they were told after the superiors huddled for a while and studied the information, they were told, no, nothing to worry about. These planes are simply American planes. American planes on maneuvers, probably flying from the deck of the aircraft carrier, the USS Lexington, and there was one other out there. So don't worry about a thing. Everything will be fine. 
At 7.45 a.m., these men staring at the screen, wondering, 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 they left and went for breakfast. But when they went for breakfast, the uh, blob had disappeared from the radar screen because those planes now were so close to Oahu that the hills had now rendered the radar incapable of picking them up anymore. That's how close the planes were. They left for breakfast at 7.45. Eight minutes later, it was 7.53, and the first bombs started raining down from the sky. Carnage, devastation, death, and destruction followed. The great tragedy of it all is that for an hour, for a solid hour, there was clear, inescapable, irrefutable evidence of what was about to take place. Evidence that danger was at hand. The signs were screaming out that death was about to be in the air. And the signs were observed and ignored. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a dangerous thing to ignore the signs. You don't want to do that. In the Bible, there are signs that clearly indicate that the end of the world is near. Signs that Jesus is about to return. And these are signs that you just don't want to miss. In fact, the disciples of Jesus came to him one day and they asked him a certain question, an interesting question, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and they said, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They had said to Jesus, oh, look at the temple. And Jesus had said, oh, there's coming a time where one stone won't be on another of the temple. Well, they asked him about that. What will be the sign, not only of the destruction of the temple, but of the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so Jesus began to tell them what it would be like in the world in the times immediately before he returned. Now, God speaks to us by a variety of means. He'll speak to you through your impressions. Be careful with that. He'll speak to you through others, through providences. But his primary method of communication with humanity is the Bible. And there is a book in the Bible that is specifically geared towards speaking to us here in earth's last days. The book of Revelation was written by one of Jesus' closest friends, John. John was present when Jesus was baptized. He was present when Jesus was crucified. John was present with Jesus and he lived with Jesus for in excess of three years. They were very close. John was one of the leaders of the early Christian church. John wrote the book of Revelation while he was under house arrest on the island of Patmos, a Greek island, very small, smaller than the city of Chattanooga. Closer to Turkey than Greece, but nevertheless a Greek island. John wrote the book of Revelation, that book directed to us in earth's last days. Revelation was intended to be God's message to a world poised on the end of edge of time. The first verse of Revelation is very significant. It starts off by saying this, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now, there's a key point right there. The book is the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning it should show us Jesus himself. It should reveal to us what's on Christ's heart. It would reveal to us his thoughts towards a world that has lost its way. That same first verse says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him. That's important. This thing was not the invention of man. Although people wrestle sometimes trying to understand the deep mysteries of the book of Revelation, sometimes these things are dismissed as unimportant or, or not even possible to be understood. Well, no, this was a revelation of Jesus and it was given by God. Revelation 1 and verse 3 says something significant. Notice this. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is at hand. I'll never forget the fellow in Kentucky who told me that his preacher said, the book of Revelation is just a Stephen King book tucked inside the back of the Bible. Well, no, 
How can that be? It's a revelation of Jesus himself. It's given by God. I don't know if God would say, blessed is the one who reads Stephen King books. I think the nightmares you have afterwards might say otherwise. But God says, blessed is the one who reads this book. Those who hear the words of this prophecy. This is telling. Blessed is the one who keeps those things which are written in it. And then God says, for the time is at hand. Well, what time might that be? Well, some of the book of Revelation deals with ancient times, the times in which John was living. That's true. There are seven churches mentioned in the early chapters of the book of Revelation, and John shared messages with those direct churches. They were real, literal churches that existed in Asia Minor in what we today would call Turkey. So those passages of the book of Revelation were primarily intended for that time, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, you can read the letters to the seven churches and find clear, powerful, necessary messages for us today. But it's true that some of Revelation dealt with ancient time. It's true that some of what you read in the book of Revelation has been uh, fulfilled already. There's no question about that. But when you get to the second half of the book of Revelation, that's where you find God writing clearly about a beast a beast that brings spiritual calamity to the world. In the second half of the book of Revelation, not only do you read about the beast, but then there is an image to the beast. And associated with that is something called the mark of the beast. Anybody who receives the mark of the beast cannot be saved. In fact, Revelation says... Everybody on earth is going to follow after this beast, except that small group of people who have their names written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Later in Revelation, you read about the battle of Armageddon, and you read about the seven last plagues. Further on, there's something called Babylon. Babylon, which would dominate the world like ancient Babylon did. And then in Revelation chapter 19, there's a graphic picture, a wonderful picture, written in words by John the Revelator, a picture of the second coming of Jesus, the one declared in the Bible to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Before Revelation is complete, the earth has been made new and things are returned to perfection. God said, the time is at hand. The inescapable conclusion we come to is that sooner or later, there would be a generation of people living on the earth for whom those things are at hand. And so tonight we investigate this and we pause long enough to determine whether or not the time could be at hand for us. Could it be that the last great events to come upon planet earth are at hand? Undoubtedly, they could be. Sure, but are they? How do we know for sure? We'll dig into the Bible tonight. There have been a lot of people down through the years who have predicted that the end of time is at hand, and they've been dead wrong. You remember not that long ago, a radio preacher in California came out and very boldly said that judgment day was coming. He named the date, and people looked on. The media gave him a lot of publicity, not because anyone in the media believed it, but because the media knows nothing attracts attention like a good train wreck. And this was only going to be a train wreck. No, Jesus didn't return. Judgment Day didn't happen. They were just plain wrong, and that's unfortunate. It's no wonder people roll their eyes and shrug sometimes when you talk about the end. Even Christians, even Christians have heard so much talk about the return of Jesus and the end of the world that some of them have said, look, maybe it's just not for real after all. Maybe we should just forget about the whole thing. Now, before we investigate that, there's something that I want to stress, and that's this. When we talk about the end of the world from a biblical perspective, we are framing this in the context of good news. Because look, if what the Bible says is true, the world as we know it coming to the end isn't the end, but it's the beginning of something new. Because we read in the Bible that Jesus will come back. We read in the Bible that when Jesus returns, there will be no more death. Somebody say amen. There will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. There won't be any child abuse, spousal abuse. There won't be marital discord. There will be no racism on that day. No longer 
Will there be the bitterness of injustice? When Jesus comes back, he's going to make all things new. So this is good news. We're not simply sitting around waiting for a conflagration or a calamity to send us all to ruin. Oh, no. Thank God tonight we look forward with hope. Because if the Bible can be trusted at all, it's telling us that there is a great day coming where Jesus will return and lead his people out of the Egypt, that is this world, and on to the promised land which is to come. So tonight, we look forward with hope. Now, I understand that we have another question. We're going to go to the screen here and introduce a question for tonight. You know that you can submit questions through Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and Bill G. has submitted a question to us via Facebook. World War I and World War II were huge events. Are there prophecies that mentioned them? Well, I think I can answer that, Bill. Thank you for your question by saying yes and no. You will not find a verse in the Bible that directly speaks to World War I, nor will you find a verse in the Bible that directly speaks to World War II. However, we're going to find some verses in just a few moments that speak to this thing generally, and I believe that you'll find, yes, right there the Bible is referring to these conflagrations, these battles, and others besides. If Jesus is going to return to this earth, it's got to be the best, happiest, greatest event ever to have happened in the human history. Since the creation of the world, since Jesus came to the earth 2,000 years ago, the return of Jesus has thrilled the hearts of men and women since time immemorial. The first book of the Bible written, written was the book of Job. And in the book of Job, you find these words filled with hope. Job chapter 19, let's look at them together. Job 19, you read in Job 19, we pick it up in verse, we'll see 25. Job said, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last upon the earth. Job went on to say, Job went on to say, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. How my heart yearns within me. You see, even Job, Job in his bitterness, Job in his distress, Job in the depths of his dismay, he looked forward to a better day coming. He knew that he could look beyond the heartbreak and the hurt of his own present experience and know that good things were coming. So Christ will return. He offers hope to the world tonight, a world that is languishing in hopelessness. Now, look, I understand that if, if, if you're living in a village and ISIS is on the way, uh, it would almost sound callous for me to say, have hope, Jesus is coming back. I don't think we deliver the message quite like that. But you know that it does offer hope. You've met people suffering from terrible diseases, some of them who are not going to survive, but they have hope because they know there's a resurrection coming. They know there's a better day coming. There are some people who on this earth are just, we call them less fortunate, and they don't have a lot, and their burdens are great, but they know one day they will lay down their burdens, and one day they will wear the crown and live in the mansion that Jesus is preparing for them now. So there is hope. We have reasons to be hopeful today, I believe. Or as we look at the signs that Jesus spoke about, are we deceiving ourselves? Really, are we without hope? Well, let's go back to that question. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, the disciples of Jesus asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They asked him point blank. Now, before we look at Jesus' answer, please know something. We're not here to try to find a date for the end of the world. You're not going to come to Revelation today and hear me say, take out your calendar and circle this, this one. We're not into that. Jesus spoke very clearly to this, very clearly. Now, on the one hand, he said you'll see signs so that you can know that his return is near, even at the door. That's pretty near. But also, he said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, these are very significant words. But of that day and hour, no one knows. 
not even the angels of heaven, but, but who only? Only his Father. So let's not kid ourselves, okay? There have been plenty of people down through the years who've said Jesus is returning on this day. The end of the world is happening at this time. Folks even climbed on the bandwagon with the blood moons. And they said the blood moons are portents of the imminent end of the world. All right. Well, they weren't. Then you'll get others who will look at the prophecies and they'll say, well, this prophecy expires in this year. And add a few more years and maybe that's the, and what I love it, they say, I'm not saying that the end of the world is happening then. But maybe, in other words, what they're doing is they're saying the end of the world is going to happen right then. And the fact is, it isn't. So we don't want to be naming dates, uh, pretending that we know when. There's no problem saying what we know. And that is, we believe we know that Jesus is coming back soon. That's close enough. But we're not into dates and times and seasons. You know, the Bible tells us something significant. I think this is significant. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. It says, all what Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And Paul, who wrote these words to the young church leader, Timothy, added a little more on the end of what he just said there. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I say amen to that. Can you say amen? I believe that. That's worth believing. And, and, and here's where you'll be surprised. If you've just spent your time believing that the Bible is the Word of God and God breathed all of it, you might be surprised to know that even within Christianity, there are many who say, well, some of it's inspired, or some of it perhaps isn't inspired, and this isn't accurate. I'm one who believes God inspired it, it was written down, all of it is trustworthy, we can believe it all. Can you say amen to that? All right. However, the Bible does not say that all opinions are inspired by God. Now, we're all welcome to our own opinions, and I don't know if it's even realistic to expect that everyone would agree on every point regarding everything in the Bible. Because we are what we are, we're going to see things from different angles, perhaps. We want to be careful about two things. Number one, we want to be making sure that our desire is to know the truth. Jesus said, the truth will make you free. He did not say that a lie will or that a tradition will or that an opinion will. The truth will make you free. That's very important. The other thing is this. A lot of people are reluctant to give up their own opinions. They just are. Uh, they'll lift up their own opinions above the Bible. That's unfortunate. We need to have enough humility that we're praying, Lord, guide me. God, show me. What is the message of the Bible? We don't want to get into the Bible and just wrestle with it and try to impose our own thoughts, our own ideas, our own logic onto the Bible. That's not God's way. Instead, we come to the Bible in an honest effort to search and understand what God's message to us is through the Bible. Now, that may sound like only a subtle difference, but it's a great difference. Instead of coming to the Bible and saying, I'll decide what this means, particularly when you get to prophecies that are symbolic and a little mysterious, you want to find the Bible keys to unlocking those Bible mysteries. All Scripture is given by inspiration God, uh, of God. And then Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew 24 and verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now he went to, on to say, See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Wars and rumors of wars. World War I, there were 24 million people who died. 24 million. World War II, 60 million. Now, just try to imagine how massive that number is. 60 millions of people who died in World War II. A huge number. It leads me to think that if Jesus wasn't referring to this day, 
My goodness, what was he referring to? We can add to that the Korean War and the Vietnam War and the Gulf War and the war on terrorism and wars that are taking place around the world today that don't even make the news and don't even register with our consciousness. When Jesus said that a sign of earth's last days, a sign of his coming and of the end of the world is wars and rumors of wars, there is no question he could easily have been talking about our day. Now, he adds to that, Matthew 24 and verse 7, where he says, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. To go back to our Facebook question from before, here is where Jesus specifically talks about wars. Undoubtedly, he could have been talking about world wars one and two. Imagine trying to explain to one of the people listening to the Sermon on the Mount or to Jesus' message in Matthew chapter 24 that 60 million people would die in one war. They just find it hard to get, get their mind around that number. Then he said, there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Now, we're doing okay. We're eating pretty well. Perhaps even in our neighborhood, there are people who are hungry but without wanting to sound callous, not many. You understand, we, we live in a very blessed part of the world. So it's easy to forget that while we're doing well, and while we know that our next meal probably isn't very far away, there have been at least a dozen famines or food crises affecting millions and millions of people in the last decade. The United Nations tells us that one in nine people don't get enough food to live a healthy, active life. We can forget that from our place of comfort. Well, that's a huge problem. What if 11% of the people here this evening just section themselves off in one place and we said that many people here tonight don't get enough food to live a healthy, active life? But that's how it is on a global level. One child dies every five seconds from hunger-related causes. In spite of the fact that one-third of the food produced on our planet is wasted. Can you get your head around that? Maybe that's a sign of the times. That in a world that is evidently so advanced so intelligent, so studied, so qualified, so technologically way up there that we can't figure out how to stop people from dying from hunger-related causes when a third of all of the food that we produce is wasted. That's amazing. In the United States, the average American wastes 220 pounds of food a year. Can you believe it? And yet there are starving people all over the planet. I sure hope that we don't have to wait too much longer. I hope this doesn't keep on going too much longer in this world. It must break God's heart. Jesus said famines and pestilences. Now let's think about this because there are pestilences in our midst that we don't even see anymore. Now, AIDS is killing 2 million people a year. We thank God for the advancements in, in drug medication treatment. Thank the Lord that now HIV is not necessarily a death sentence. Folks can live for many years now, healthy and productive lives while suffering with HIV. So we thank God. However, recently an HIV expert came out and she said, no, I do not believe there will ever be a cure. Wow. One person dying every 15 seconds. Folks all over the world are dying from heart disease and cancer and diabetes. Wait, pestilences? Yes. Did you know, you might not have, there are more than 80 million pre-diabetics in the United States right now. And millions of diabetics, it's costing the nation billions and billions and billions of dollars. We all know somebody who died from a heart attack. We all know people with cancer. These diseases are eating our society up. They are modern day 
pestilences. We don't think about them because they're just common. You have diabetes. Well, you just take your medication or get your jab or whatever the case might be. That's okay. Thank God for that. Millions of people doing that. Modern day pestilence. But then there are the diseases that really scare us. The ones that bother us like Ebola and SARS and mad cow disease. These are terrifying diseases, scary diseases. Jesus said a sign of the last days would be famines and pestilences. Well, you say, now I don't mean to scare you here, and I'm sure none of our Chattanooga area hospitals have this issue. But in one city in which I was living, a relative was put into the hospital. It's in North Carolina. And the hospital staff said the very best thing you can do is get your family member out of the hospital as soon as you can. And this was information on the up and up. It wasn't criticism whispered in a corner. We said, well, why would that be? They said, the risk of infection here is so high, you're better off getting your family member home where he is likely going to be far more safe. Pestilences. Now, you might think that my definition of pestilence is stretching things just a little bit, but I don't think so. We are sicker, perhaps, than we have ever been in our modern world, our enlightened world, with all of our science and all of our medication and all of our research and all of our study, we are 666. Did I just say 666? I didn't mean to. Sick, sick, sick. We'll get to that later. Now we have another question. Let's take our, our, our next question that's just coming. Where's it coming from? We'll find out as soon as we see it on the screen. This question has come from Lori, and it's on Facebook. On day one, you talked about Daniel and the dream of the ten toe kingdoms. Was Great Britain one of the toes? There was a time when the sun did not set on the British kingdom. That's true. Well, let me hit the pause button here and and go back to Daniel chapter 2. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome would divide into nations. How many? It doesn't say 10 in Daniel 2. In Daniel 7, it says 10. It says feet and toes, so you would assume 10 toes. But Daniel 7 helps us understand 10 kingdoms. Rome divided into 10 nations that sprung up in its place. The people groups were the the Suevi, the Portuguese, the Alamanni. Anyone who speaks Spanish knows the Alamanni is the German people. The Lombards, the Anglo-Saxons, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Franks, that's the French, the uh, Franks, Heruli, Ostrogoths, and uh, Burgundians. I hope I didn't miss anybody out. So those nations... Now, let me say this. That does not mean Great Britain is mentioned in Daniel chapter 2. It's not. We just know that Rome would divide into ten nations. Three of them, the Vandals and the Heruli, and I've got to be careful because I might be forgetting, have been wiped out. Certainly the Vandals who are from North Africa, that's where they emanated from. The other seven, those tribes developed into nations that we recognize today, including Switzerland and Italy and Great Britain. So yes, in Daniel chapter 2, Laurie, thanks for your question, when Rome divided, one of the nations that raised up in its place, or let me say this, one of the people groups were the Anglo-Saxons, who ultimately went on to become the people that we know today as Great Britain. So thanks for that question. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, Jesus spoke. What did he say? Famines and pestilences, and he said earthquakes. Now, if you don't live in an earthquake zone, you're not going to bed at night worried about earthquakes. Uh, I grew up in New Zealand, which is on the Pacific Ring of Fire. Volcanoes and earthquakes there. Lived in Southern California for a while. I felt right at home. Laying in bed one night, and you, you just know it when it happens, and the ground starts to shake, and things are rocking, and you just hope to yourself, man, I hope this isn't the big one. I've been in two of those Little, little, little temblors in California, one in Northern California, and you just pray quickly, Lord, not now. But all around the world, there are people for whom earthquakes and earthquake destruction is a daily reality, certainly a daily possibility. You know, just not long ago in Japan, an earthquake measuring 9.0 on the Richter scale, that's a big one shook Japan so hard that an entire island was moved six feet. And the resulting tsunami caused devastation and damage and 15 thousands of deaths. One earthquake. But there have been bigger. Remember the 
tsunami in Asia just before Christmas in 2004. It killed 230,000 people. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. And we wonder, when Jesus says earthquakes, could he be talking about this our day? You know, I think he could. Major earthquakes in New Zealand, in China, in Chile, in Indonesia. Let's think, in 2005, Pakistan, 80,000 people dead. In 2008, 70,000 dead in China. In 2010, 222,000 people died from one earthquake in Haiti. That's phenomenal. Are you going to tell me it's going to get worse? Maybe it will, but please, Jesus, don't let it get too much worse. These are catastrophic events, massive events. They have to be telling us, yes, we are living in that age that Jesus spoke about when he was talking about the signs of his return. And then, and then we start thinking about weather-related events. Who can forget these things? Slamming our planet. Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, it was a one-two punch causing $150 billion worth of damage. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. The damage was one thing, but think of the devastation, the loss of life. The families torn apart, the communities destroyed. You can't put a price on that. We had never seen such a thing before in our nation's history. This was the worst we had ever experienced. However, it's not just rain coming down from the sky. In some places, it's, it's a lack of rain. If time goes on much longer, we might be wondering if what they're witnessing in California right now is one of these droughts of biblical proportion. Not long ago in the Amazon, there were two once-in-a-hundred-year droughts, except they didn't happen a hundred years apart. They happened within five years. These kinds of crazy weather events are going on all the time. Think about this in terms of another sign that Jesus gave. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 37. Now look at this. Matthew 20, uh, 24, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now let's see what he said. As the days of Noah were. What were the days of Noah like? Let's look in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only what? Evil how? Evil continually. They sat around plotting and scheming and planning how to be more evil than they'd been before. There's another verse in Genesis that we have to see. Genesis 6 and verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with what? Does it sound like the earth in which we live today? It does, doesn't it? Now, I'll grant you, murder rates in many major American cities are down from what they were 20 to 25 years ago. Thank the Lord. But in recent years, they've started to surge back up again. And what we see around us on our streets, in our cities, around the world, suggests to us that we're living in that day. Noah's day was characterized by violence. Jesus said the day of his return will be like Noah's day. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are there. Now, how bad does it, does it have to be before we realize the place that we've arrived at? Let's go back to what seems like ancient history. But for some of us, it was just yesterday. Columbine, Colorado. It was 1999. And two boys with guns ran amok. And by the time they were done, 15 people were dead. Now, those boys planned to do even greater harm. They had studied ways of, of producing bombs that they actually set and planted. They just didn't work like they thought. They wanted to kill everybody in the school. That's what they wanted to do. Thank God it didn't work out that way. That was bad. We wondered if this was just about as bad as it could get. We discovered, no, it could get worse. 2007, on a university campus in Virginia, one gunman was responsible for the deaths of 33 people. 33. 
We could mention Sandy Hook as well. Horrible tragedies. Roseburg, Oregon, days ago, 10 dead. <laughs> Law enforcement authorities, they tell us now that we can anticipate having a school shooting every two months. Just rely on it every two months. The frequency is increasing and not decreasing. In peaceful Norway, just a few years ago, a man ran amok and eventually took the lives of 77 people. 77. Now we live with the scourge of terrorism. In some parts of the world, you have to fear ISIS. We thought Al-Qaeda was bad, and now it seems that these guys are worse. If you're living in Nigeria, you have to deal with Boko Haram. In other parts of the world, there are other groups, and all of these flashpoints taking place all at the same time. The Middle East is a powder keg. The Holocaust happened 70 years ago, and yet there are nations in the Middle East looking at Israel and saying, we are committed to the destruction of that nation and those people. Somehow that's tolerated in this world. I don't quite know how, but that's the world in which we live. Violence continually, or evil continually, filled with violence. We remember 9-11. You know, it used to be, where were you when Kennedy got shot? It used to be, where were you when you heard that we'd landed on the moon? Now, I don't know that anyone could forget where they were when they learned about 9-11. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. My wife and I and our small son, our second child, hadn't been born. And we were staying in a little house in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The television didn't work. I was getting my email, and this is in the ancient olden times where it was dial-up. And if the demand was high, then it just, it just took forever for your web page to populate. And when it did, it said something about a plane crashing into the World Trade Center. I called to Melissa, 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 this, this, this can't be real. What in the world? And then the headline said that they were trying to land a plane on top of the White House. So we got in the car and we drove to Walmart and we joined a crowd of people gathered around a television set and we stared at that thing and the footage was played over and over again of the plane coming in and hitting that tower and we just looked at that and we said this cannot be happening. Who could do such a thing? How could this take place in New York City? I don't think there's anybody alive who does not believe 9-11 could happen again. I think we all know it could. That's why when you go through an airport, uh, to an airport, you've, you've got to go through a machine that takes a photograph of, of what you look like beneath your clothes because they're looking for weaponry. Your bags are x-rayed and frequently searched. It wasn't like that in the good old days. But now we live with it because we believe we must for there are people in this world who would do again what has once been done evil continually, filled with violence. It's an absolute tragedy. We wonder if it could ever get worse. And then we witnessed tragedy come close to home here in Chattanooga, just hundreds of yards from where we are right now, just over there. Across Highway 153, can you roll it? Across Highway 153, we didn't witness, thank God, but we witnessed the aftermath of an awful, awful, awful tragedy. Several people left dead. Shots were fired. A gunman fled to another location. More shots were fired. And funerals were conducted as a result. And this isn't New York City. We're not in Detroit. We're not in Newark. This isn't New Orleans. This was Chattanooga. This was our backyard. Things like this are supposed to happen in other places. 
But the devil doesn't reserve his best work for other places. He reserves it for everywhere. And it's evidence to us that we're living in a world that's filled with violence, a, a living in a world where in some people's lives and minds there is only evil continually. We're living in a world where you cannot take your safety for granted. You just cannot. We are living in a world where it's routine for people to have burglar alarms and to lock their doors several times. We go to great lengths to protect ourselves because even here, even in the unlikely places, even in little old Chattanooga, the unthinkable can happen. That's where we are. And we ask ourselves, could it be that we are near the return of Jesus? I'd like to invite a special guest to come forward. He is one of Chattanooga's finest. Uh, I'm expecting that he's here and is going to come forward any moment. He was sitting. Oi, how about that? Ooh. Just appeared from out of nowhere. <laughs> how you doing, sir? Captain McPherson. How you well, doing? Thank you very much. Thank you Captain for having Captain McPherson from the Chattanooga Police. You were affected very personally by this awful tragedy. Tell me how. Yes, sir. I'm the uh, district commander in the area where the... Uh, incident occurred fall, fell under my command and I was me along with all the other officers was a part of the uh, command center that set everything up when the tragic event occurred so just so you know where we are meeting tonight this is part of Captain McPherson's beat so, so you'll behave yourself okay. <laughs> you'll do that one of your colleagues was wounded Yes, sir, and he's uh, recovering, doing very well. Uh, thanks to you all prayers and uh, everyone reaching out to him and uh, the community came together and he's very uh, elated to hear from all the people that uh, sent their prayers and wishes for him and he's doing well now. Thank, Thank you, Lord. You've been yes. on the force 23 and a half years. Yes, sir. What changes have you witnessed in society in that 23 and a half years? Uh, from the day I first came on as a rookie to now I've seen a drastic change in the way uh, as far as violence goes. Um, what changes so, have you seen? Um, just with the youth, I'll just start with them. Uh, the type of crimes that the youth are being involved in now, the violent crimes that they're being involved in now, uh, at that age, you and I at that age, we wouldn't have dared thought of being involved or a part of something like that. So why do you think that change has, has taken place? I think social media plays a key role. I think that's taken the place of some of the parenting, not for everyone, but for the young men and women that has free access to the social media sites without parents checking on them, checking behind them. They begin to believe that what they see and what they hear as the gospel, as we say, and that's their idol. Seems like there's been a desensitizing among young yes. people towards violence and violent crime. Yes, and that's what I was going to add too. They're desensitized to different type of crimes, as I stated earlier, where we would all be shocked or blown away by it. It's just another day to some of the young men and women when you interview them or talk to them, either by if they were involved in it or if they seen it or was a part of it or witnessed it. It's just like, oh, well. As you look into the future, and I, and I don't want to ask you to exercise a gift of prophecy, just, just <laughs> your own personal judgment here. You look into the future, where are we headed? If, if we were here another 100 years, what would, based on the trend that you're witnessing, what would society look like 100 years from now? Well, as I said before, I, not even 100 years. If I witness what I have in the 23 plus years, if I witness that in the next 23 years, not even 100 years, God help us. Okay, then, what's the solution? How do we get our arms around this and, and start to turn this back? Uh, I have two opinions, my personal opinion and my professional opinion. My personal opinion, prayer. Prayer changes things. Amen. And also in that, uh, it starts at home. Yes. It starts at home. Yes, it does. So we have to, uh, before we can come outside and ask for everyone else help or your help or my help the parents have to take that lead role quit being your child's friend be a parent my parent was not my friend i was not my daughter's friend she'll that's tell right. you you're a daddy i'm a parent first sure. parent first that's yes, right yes sir so
Prayer changes things. Yes, and then in my pers professional opinion, everyone working together, starting with lawmakers on down to the uh, faith-based community, to the everyday citizen. We all have to, it takes a village to raise a child. Sure. And we have to get back to that. And the only way we're gonna do that is everyone working together as one to go after those uh, that's committing those type of crimes and things and try to deter them from doing it. We appreciate you very much. Thank you for the wonderful work you do, the selfless work you do, keeping us safe. Thank you. Captain McPherson. Have a blessed day. Thank, Thank you. you. Captain McPherson from Chattanooga City Police. We are truly, truly grateful. Now, you might be tempted to say, John, there have always been natural disasters, earthquakes, famines, pestilences. Yeah, they're all over the Bible. But notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8. This is telling. It's significant. Matthew 24, 8. Jesus was speaking about these signs. He said, all these are the beginnings of sorrows. That word sorrows, it means birth pains. Now, I'm no expert on birth pains. I have had little experience. Not as much experience as my wife has had. Late the night before my, our first child was born, uh, we knew Melissa was very close to delivering. And what happened was it was about 1 o'clock in the morning, and she reached over and grabbed my arm in the bed, and she said, I think the baby's on its way. Now, young men, you ought to learn a lesson right here. It was 1 o'clock in the morning. What should you be doing at 1 o'clock in the morning? Exactly right. So I suggested to Melissa, I said, you know, the very best thing you could do, I think, is to get some sleep. That's what I think. What? The midwife had said, don't call until such and such, and that hadn't happened. This was just like sign number one. And so I'm saying, well, honey, you need, it's going to be a big day. You ought to get some sleep. Now, honestly, I don't know how much sleep Melissa got. I got some. I did. There's no point both of us being tired. But here's what I learned about birth pains. When the child is on the way, the contractions begin. At first, not quite so intense. Careful, men, how you explain that. Not quite as intense, and they're further apart. But the closer you get to the baby's arrival, the contractions get closer together, and they get more intense. Jesus said the signs of his comings, and he said this, they're like birth pains. They get close together, and they get more intense. So another earthquake doesn't mean much. But a preponderance of these things, a plethora of these things, a frequency of these things introduce us to the idea Jesus is coming back soon. The signs are getting closer together and they're becoming more intense. It's not madness to realize this. It's prudent for us to recognize this and we should. And then how should we feel? Hopeless? Oh no. Luke 21 verse 28, look at this. Jesus said, when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Thank the Lord. If what we're seeing are the signs of Jesus' return, and if they're indicating to us that we are getting closer to that time, then this is a hopeful thing and not a negative thing. Now, there's another sign I want to show you. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will do what? Now, I want to tell you something about knowledge. Certainly, I think Daniel was referring to spiritual knowledge, no question. But it's undoubted that secular knowledge is included here, for secular knowledge has certainly increased and has done so dramatically. I want to show you what a five megabyte hard drive looked like in 1956. That's it. It weighed a ton, and it's being loaded onto the airplane by a forklift. Next to it is a flash drive, and a flash drive has 1,638 times more hard drive space than that one-ton hard drive did in 1956. You see, knowledge has increased. Ask a child about uh, cameras or tell a child that back in the olden days, you had to take the film out of the camera and take it to a drugstore my goodness, child would hardly believe you. You can't tell a child these days that he or she is going on like a cracked record. They don't even know what a record is. Don't understand these things, you see. If you really want to get inside a child's head, explain to the child that when you were young, if you wanted to see what was on the other channel, you had to get out of your chair, <laughs> walk across the living room, turn a knob, 
If you explain that there was only one channel, oh my goodness. Tell the child that was in black and white, they're going to laugh their heads off and ask you if you had electricity and running water back in the olden days. <laughs> Times have changed. Digital cameras, cell phones, satellite dishes, the internet, email, texting. And we know it's all going to keep on changing. Uh, our children's children are going to laugh at their parents. The fact that they texted, there'll be something new then. Are we nearly there yet? Based on what Jesus said, the inescapable conclusion is that, yes, we are. Which means the greatest event in human history is about to take place. Now, with Jesus' words, there came a caution. He said this in Matthew chapter 24. He said this. He said, take heed that no one, what? Deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. Have we seen that? Oh, yes, we have. There was a fellow named Jim Jones. Good guy, great guy. His church was a model of racial harmony. President's wife had written letters of commendation for him. Mayor of San Francisco said he was a great fellow. But he wasn't, was he? Because in 1978, he led 900 of his followers to Guyana. Among the dead were 300 children. But he was a man who said, if you want me to be your friend, I'll be your friend. He said, if you want me to be your God, I will be your God. He stood in the place of Christ for these people. Tragic. And the devil still wants to deceive. Look, I want to encourage you. There's a simple way to be undeceived or not deceived, and that is to pray and to read your Bible. Pray and read your Bible and follow Christ. Follow the leadings of Jesus. That's what you want to do. Gather around the Word of God and make that your counselor. Make that your guide. If you can't understand the beast and the plagues and the this and the that, that's okay. Understand the straightforward things in the Bible and follow that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love me, keep my commandments. These are straightforward, simple things. Follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And then when he prompts you to turn your life over to him, yield your heart. God can give you a new heart tonight, new hope tonight, uh, a new future tonight. That's what God can do. The one who made water into wine can turn a saint into a sinner. He opened the eyes of the blind when he walked on this earth. He can open our eyes and help us to see him through new eyes. Jesus raised the dead, and he can raise the spiritually dead. So if we're without hope, if we are filled with sin, we come to this God who inspired revelation. We don't come to revelation as an academic exercise. It's a spiritual exercise because it's God's book and it's a spiritual book. It's written to us about Jesus Christ, the God-man, the Savior of the world. We're not here just to gather knowledge now, but an experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. See, friends, what we read based on the Bible, on the prophecies, on revelation, on the signs of the times... What we find in the Bible, these last movements of earth's history, they will soon be fulfilled. We are living definitely in earth's last days. Earth's last days. We are there. Jesus is near even at the doors. Long ago, people used to send telegrams. When I was a kid in high school, one of my friends left school to get a job at the post office. And his first job was delivering telegrams. Remember, remember people used to get around with pages stuck on their belts. I don't even know if people bother with those things anymore. I honestly don't know. I never see them. Today we're texting and we're tweeting and we're Facebooking and we're, we're, we're doing all of these things. Instant communication. Well, there's a message that we've got to make sure we're getting. Not just the message of the Facebook generation. Not just the messages of social media. As helpful as they can be. Long ago, God placed a message in his word, and the Holy Spirit calls to us and speaks to us and says the message simply is, put your faith in God. We are down here at the business end of this earth's history. The end is near. Jesus is soon to return. Put your faith in God. We believe Jesus is coming soon. Put your faith in God. So what does that mean if the signs say Jesus is coming soon? What about the prophecies about the beast, the mark of the beast, the image to the beast? Well, that means that they're coming sooner. We cannot be far away from what Daniel called a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. We cannot be far away. The signs tell us that Jesus is coming soon. The signs say we are almost there. Therefore, 
it's important that our faith is in the right place, that we're reading the right thing, that we're hearing the right messages. We are near, we are close, the signs say so. We don't want to ignore the signs. It's been more than 100 years now, the greatest ship in the world sailed from Southampton, New England, bound for New York City, New New York. Largest ship on the water, and it was said she was the safest. However, we know what happened to the Titanic. It now sits on the seafloor beneath thousands of feet of seawater, about 600 kilometers south of Nova Scotia. We know that the Titanic hit an iceberg. We know that. But what many people forget is that while this White Star Line ship was heading west from the east towards the United States, it received, count them, nine warning messages telling it there were icebergs ahead. Nine. Every one of those messages were received and understood. And every one of those messages were ignored. And today there are cemeteries in Nova Scotia filled with the dead recovered from the wreck of the Titanic. More recently, a cruise ship, the Costa Concordia, was wrecked off the coast of a small Italian island named Isola del Giglio. It ran over a rock that tore a 160-foot gash in the hull, causing the ship to take water on and tip on its side and sink essentially. Like the Titanic, it wasn't supposed to sink. They thought, no, it's safe. It won't sink. But it sunk enough to take the lives of a number of people. But what happened was, while this ship was running over a rock, the people on board didn't know. They had not been told what to do in case of an emergency. And when the event occurred, they were told, nothing to worry about, not at all. This is simply an electrical fault. There's no reason to be alarmed. And so they went on enjoying the cruise while the ship was sinking. Friend, planet Earth is a ship that's sinking. Yeah, there's still much to enjoy, but we must not fool ourselves into thinking we're just on a cruise and everything's going to be tomorrow the same as it is today. It will not. But it's not bad news. That's good news, because beyond these last day events, there is a Jesus who is coming back to this world to gather us up, to make us his own, and to make us his own eternally. I'd like you to listen very carefully. We'll hear the words of a beautiful song as Kelsey Farnsworth sings for us tonight. Please be blessed and hear not only words, not only a song, but do hear the voice of Jesus speaking to your heart, offering you assurance and salvation and comfort and certainty. Listen, please, and be blessed. Deep river. 
Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that greatly. We're going to cross over into Hebron. We're going to cross the Jordan soon. The signs tell us Jesus is coming back. And the question isn't now, is he or do they? The question is now, what of us? What will we say to Jesus this close to his return? Let's bow our heads together and pray. Our Father and our God, we approach your throne of grace with gladness. We ask you tonight to take our hearts and make them yours. That when this great event occurs and this world comes to an end, it will be for us the best news ever. We want to be ready. We can only be ready through faith in you. We yield to you our hearts and ask that you would live your life in us. Keep us now, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just before you go, remember you're going to get study material as you go. And if you're joining us remotely, go to revelationtoday.com slash studies and tell us that you'd like us to send the study to you and we'll do it. When you get there, indicate that what you want to receive is study number two. Thanks for joining us. Much appreciated. God bless you and good night.